we develop children who have that strong life sense that, that when they walk in the door, they are healthy, they're full of life, they're ready to just absorb everything that's around them. So we nourish them in being very careful about what we feed them, but also nourishing them, their souls in the environment that we provide and in the kind of people that we have interacting with the children. The philosophy is really saying that the curriculum is the teacher. So it's who you are as an individual. That's what you're bringing in your program. Just like children absorb from the parent, that's what they do when they come to our center. They absorb from the staff. And so we try to have very well-trained staff who are a worthy model. Hi, I'm Ron Spromberg, co-founder and CEO of Hi Mama. Welcome to our podcast about all things early childhood education. Awareness around different early childhood curricula is becoming more prominent as early childhood education becomes a growing need for working parents. Nowadays, information is literally at our fingertips, and being an expecting parent myself, I've been through the search for the best early childhood education options for my newest family member. Common approaches that many of us have heard of include Montessori and Reggio-inspired programs. However, there is one philosophy that you don't hear about too often, but has actually been around for a long time and is making a comeback, and that's Waldorf. I'm really excited to be talking with Marilyn Grudniski, who has voted one of 2017's most influential women in Northern Ontario, is a dedicated early childhood educator and a huge proponent of the Waldorf philosophy. Marilyn, welcome to the Preschool Podcast. It's great to have you on the show. Well, thanks for inviting me. So Marilyn, you're the CEO of Little Lions Waldorf in Thunder Bay, Canada, and you're a special program because you're Waldorf, and we're going to get a little bit more into that. But let's first start off learning a little bit more about Little Lions and your child care programs based at a Thunder Bay. Okay, well, I, I'll tell you a bit about the history first. We started um, 35 years ago in a high school. The person who was running the home economics program started this as part of a family studies group. And the children who were enrolled were mostly the children of the teachers at the school. And a lot of high school students were involved in this, and it was all part of their program. And then a few years later, the school closed, and this group went and uh, got some funding to buy a building, and they became independent. And they stayed like that since from 1984 until 2005 when we expanded and opened our second center. And then we opened some others when there was government funding available. We took advantage of that. And we are now at 11 centers. That's interesting. So so it started out of a family studies group at a high school. That's right. So who were the children in the Little Lions program then at that time? They were the children of the teachers at the high school. Got mainly. it. And then, and then other other children could enroll as well. But it started off as a very small program. the The uh, teacher who ran that program had an interest in Waldorf, so that was the type of program she created. And it's um, the the Waldorf philosophy started in Europe, of course. And the, the teacher who ran this program had a German background, so that was her interest, and that's why it became Waldorf. Interesting, interesting. And when did you join uh, Little Lions Waldorf? In 2001, I moved back to Canada at that time. And uh, I had known about Waldorf, but didn't know very much about it. And I had had an extensive background in, in teaching school. So this was my first introduction to early childhood. And I uh, started at the center and within a year became the supervisor. And then as we grew, my position changed to CEO. Cool. And where did you move to Canada from? Uh, I've been in Chile before that. Um, I've worked extensively in other countries and other continents. My husband worked for the UN and so we did a fair bit of traveling. I was gone from Thunder Bay for 26 years. So coming back to Thunder Bay and finding this little Waldorf program, it was just such a little treasure. And I just fell in love with it and I stayed. Oh, wow. That's neat. 
And so let's now dive into the Waldorf philosophy or approach a little bit more and correct me if I'm using the right or wrong words to describe it. Um, but let's start off just sort of with the basics uh, of what it is and maybe how it's different to other methodologies or approaches that are out there in early childhood education. Well, it's based on the work of Rudolf Steiner. So you might hear it referred to as Steiner education. Okay. And it's got, a, I think, close to 2,000 schools worldwide. It, it's a, a very large worldwide program. But in the, the Waldorf philosophy, they really um, promoted staying home with your children when they're young, like really protecting the first seven years of life and uh, you know, so that, that the children are, are immersed in their family life and they, they aren't exposed to school type learning until mm. until age seven. Mm -hmm. You see that in some countries like Finland is very similar to that. So that's what the Waldorf philosophy was like. And because of that, then they weren't really promoting childcare centers or things like that. But we we find that as society evolves and things change, our lives are still very different than they were a hundred years ago when this philosophy started. With, that there is a need for early childhood care. And because the so many families now have both parents working, we we find that the the home life is not the same as it was. And part of our our uh, of our philosophy is that we're trying to recreate that here for children. So they they have that sense of home, that sense of belonging and uh, kind of replacing some of the things that they might be missing in their home life. Yeah, right. So I guess that's kind of the main philosophy then is if uh, in its infancy, the goal was to have children staying at home up to age seven is for you to basically try and replicate that in your programs, right? Yeah. And so we would, for example, have um, very natural things. So in, in our program, you know, you when you walk into your home, it shouldn't feel like like a department store. Mm. So when you walk into a Waldorf center, it shouldn't feel like that. Mm. It shouldn't be shelves and rows of toys, bright plastic things like that. It's it's not like that. It's it's much more homelike, and and things are very carefully chosen. So we don't just go and buy random things. Um, you know, we're very particular about what we provide for the children. So no plastics and no electronics. We, we keep things very simple and very open-ended. We are in, inspiring a lot of creativity in children, and we're making it feel like a home. Mm, interesting. And so that's sort of something that's a bit unique from on the environment side. What about the learning and development or the pedagogy or curriculum that you're using in a Waldorf program? Well, it actually aligns very well with the new Ontario pedagogy. I don't know if you're familiar with the document, How Does Learning Happen? Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, yeah, so it's very well aligned with that because we really focus on that sense of belonging mm. that, that children have and, and how they engage with the environment and engage with other people. It's, um, you know, that's very, we're very careful about that. It, the, the philosophy is really saying that the curriculum is the teacher. So it's who you are as an individual. That's what you're bringing to your children to, in your program. Just like the ch children absorb from the parent, that's what they do when they come to our center. They absorb from the staff. And so we try to have very well-trained staff who are um, the right, just the right temperament to be with children because children, they have to be a, a, a worthy model for them. Mm -hmm. Of course, so of course. We're very particular about that. Yeah. So for our listeners who may not be familiar with Ontario's How Does Learning Happen, can you describe to them what that is in a nutshell? Well, it's, it's based on four principles, expression, engagement, well-being, and belonging. And in our philosophy, those four things really figure very, you know, we put a lot of weight on that, particularly the well-being, that the well-being of children. In our philosophy, we, we talk about the etheric. 
it's that life sense that you have. And we find a lot of children uh, come with their life sense already depleted and um, with the, the different things that are going on in their homes and in their lives in general and just being in today's society. So how do we strengthen that core? How do we have really... Um, how do we develop children who have that strong life sense that, that when they walk in the door, they're healthy, they're full of life, they're ready to just absorb everything that's around them. So we nourish them in being very careful about what we feed them, but also nourishing them, their souls in the environment that we provide and in the kind of people that we have interacting with the children. Mm-hmm. Interesting. And this is also what we're looking for generally in Ontario. It, it fits very well with that framework. So it's it's interesting because it's almost like we're coming to maybe more of a consensus on early childhood education. And of course, we have a lot more to learn and we're always going to, but uh, perhaps, you know, some of the different models and approaches and methodologies are starting to uh, come together and and to one, I I don't want to call it a model or I guess um, a certain guiding principles that our best practices, um, and, and this maybe is a good example of, you know, something that's over a hundred years old with Waldorf is now starting to align with something that's coming out of the government of Ontario, a provincial government, in terms of what they're recommending to childcare and early learning programs here in Ontario. Yes, you're right. We we're so thrilled with this because you know a decade or two ago. If we looked at what the government was putting out, it was nothing that we could use. Mm. We were always sort of out there, a little different. And and people who were looking for that specifically would find Waldorf and they just loved it. Right. And now it, it's, uh, now we find that it, the government is aligning with us, not the other way around. Hmm. So it, it, in fact, when I was at a meeting once, someone from the, the government said to me, oh, we finally landed in your world. Uh, yep, that's right. It was a thrill. <laughs> Because now, you know, we are we are not this weird program out there. Now people are realizing that oh, all along we should have been doing that. So we feel quite justified in what we're doing. And um, yeah, and so thrilled that now people are copying us. Very cool. Um, now, just changing tracks a little bit. Let's say I'm an administrator or a leader of a child care, early childhood education program. And I'm interested in transitioning to be a Waldorf program. How would that work? Where would I even begin with that? I guess you'd begin in your own heart. So you would, you know, for you to decide you want to be a Waldorf program, you'd have to research, you know, what that's all about. And it's all about who you are as a person. So you would be, it has, in fact, a, a spiritual base. If you look at the science, at the spiritual science behind it, what Steiner wrote, and to, um, you would have to decide, are you going to just adopt all the, the practical things about Waldorf? And is that what's drawing you to it? Or is there a deeper spiritual connection? So with the, the Waldorf philosophy, it's all about freedom. So nobody can say to you, you have to believe this or that. So nobody in the Waldorf in the program would say, no, this is what Steiner said, and this is what you have to believe. It's not like that. You read it, and you come to your own understanding, and then what do you take in and, and work with in your own heart? Mm. So he- the person who wants to be a Waldorf, you know, wants to be in, have a Waldorf environment, you, would, you could make it look Waldorf. You can come and copy our decor and all of that and it wouldn't necessarily be Waldorf unless there's the the staff behind you know who are um, who are carrying this are are really believing all these in in all these principles or if you know they don't necessarily have to believe in quotation marks uh, the the whole spiritual science science behind what Steiner created but they have to have an understanding of it and then you work with your own beliefs. So it's it's very open. People think that, oh, it's closed. It's not a religion, It's but it could be a spiritual path for someone. 
and um, and you're free to accept or not accept any of that. And in so what it, you're, it comes from a very different, very different than than saying, okay, now we're going to be this philosophy, and then just check mark, you know, this is what you have to do. It's with it's not like that for us. And in what you're saying, I can already see a lot of the relationship with Ontario's How Does Learning Happen, which, of course, is the title of the document is in the form of a question. And so, of course, there, the you know part of the implication of that is there's no sort of right answer and, and you're free to ask questions and always be learning. Um, question for you, given what you've just described, which I think makes a ton of sense and I think applies even to anything we do in life, which is that you know, it should be authentic. And that's really the only way you're going to be successful with that is if you truly believe in it uh, with your heart, as you say. And I guess in that case, the leadership of the Waldorf program would be central to that happening and that sort of being part of the culture of the Waldorf program. Right. You have to have a leader who's promoting it, who's modeling it, who lives it. And so our podcast uh, really is focusing on the future leaders of early childhood education. And so can you tell us a little bit more about, you know, in your role as a leader, what does that mean in your day to day and working with your educators and families and children to have that culture where everybody is, um, part of this authentic Waldorf environment? Well, we found that it was uh, because we grew very fast, you know, from 2005, you know, we, we grew over about eight years to, to have 11 centers. So with all that growth, we don't have enough Waldorf trained teachers and it's very costly to send people away. The closest Waldorf training to Thunder Bay would be in Toronto, and then there's another one in BC. So this is very costly to send someone away to do a 400-hour training spread out over two years. It's a lot of flying back and forth. So what we decided is that we need to have our own training center here. So we're not yet accredited, but what we did was our original building is going to be renovated next year, and that will become our training center. We're already training staff in a rented space, and we bring in presenters from all around the world. We've had a very close connection with um, Bernadette Rackley from Athena in New Zealand. She was she came every summer for about six years to work with us. And we have Kim John Payne, who's the author of Simplicity Parenting. He's been coming for the past two years, and we'll continue with him for a few years. So we bring the the Waldorf trainers here and we're training our staff here on site because that's the only way that we're going to be able to say we're truly Waldorf because the staff need so badly need to have this strong base. And that's how we decided to work with it. So professional development of your staff is clearly something that's very important for you. Right. Yeah. And as a leader, I'm playing a major role in the training center and uh, it, as a as a Waldorf uh, organization, we're very careful to um, take everyone's input. So if we looked at a Waldorf school, then they those Waldorf schools are basically teacher run, where the teachers get together, they meet weekly, they make decisions. Where in a childcare center, where you have a lot of government regulations there has to be that leader who's signing off and doing those things. So it's a little bit of a different organization, but I have regular meetings with my site supervisors and together we brainstorm, okay, we need a new policy on this. What would we need to have in that policy? What does everybody think? I don't just create something and say, here, this is it. We work on it together. And it's also the same way with our board. The board ultimately has the decision-making power, but you know we, we do a lot of work at the grassroots level, if you want to talk about it that way, where the, the site supervisors have weekly staff meetings and they get input from their staff. It comes to our site supervisor meetings and we create something, then we take it to the board for approval. So it's... Um, it's very collaborative compared to other models. 
Yeah. And so clearly you've got a governance system in place, which works for you, but it sounds like you're empowering your teachers to have an influence and make decisions and move positive progress forward in your programs through these weekly meetings. Is there anything else that you do to empower your teachers? This is something that we really try to emphasize at Hi Mama. So uh, that's why I'm interested to learn a little bit more about the teacher empowerment piece. Oh, um, well, our teachers can just take on projects and run with them on their own. And we do have a social responsibility committee Oh, cool. Where we do things even in the community, mm. so we and, and we can do things outside early childhood that mm. fe- that we feel support the community, and that's where you know they just bring their idea forward and how do we want to work on this and what do we find that we want to support in the community and they are free to do those things and they're free to bring those ideas back to the group and we can can move forward in a new way. That's very cool. Uh, I really like that idea of the teachers getting involved outside uh, ECE, even in the community. And it's it's a great example of where they can take sort of little leadership roles to help develop those capabilities, which is excellent to hear that you're doing that. Um, we're quickly running out of time. Any other thoughts or advice that you have for early childhood educators that are starting out in their career uh, And that can be anything uh, from, you know, working with children in the classroom to professional development. Any tips or advice for them? Well, there's a lot that you can learn. There's so many good people out there, people connected with Waldorf and people who are not Waldorf, but whose values and their teachings align very well with us. Um, you you might want to recommend that they check out the Waldorf Early Childhood Association of North America. They have a website and a lot of books that are available there. Um, there are lots of workshops that are held and, and things like that that, uh, that people might want to take advantage of. Um, I think if it was one thing I would want somebody to know when they're starting off in their career, you have to have a deep understanding of attachment and how that is not just in early childhood, but how attachment plays out over time, working in your school age programs and, you know, into your own personal life. I don't think that we have done anywhere near enough work on attachment in our field and it should be primary. And, and people always say, Oh yeah, I know all about attachment. Nope. I, I mm. don't think we do yet. There's still so much to explore, and I'm still, even after all these years, I'm learning all the time about attachment. Interesting. So that would be my one bit of advice. That's a unique piece of advice. First time I've heard that advice, so I love it. Um, if I'm a listener, I want to get in touch with you, Marilyn, to learn a little bit more about yourself or about Waldorf programs. Where can I go online to get in touch with you? Oh, littlelionswaldorf.ca. Wonderful. So we have our website and the emails to the website come directly to me and I'd be glad to answer any questions. I know I probably haven't explained some things very well. So if people are questioning, why did you say that? What does that really mean? Yeah, please get in touch with me because I wouldn't want you to have the wrong idea of the philosophy just because I'm inarticulate. (laughs) So (laughs) please get in touch. (laughs) Well, Marilyn, I, from my perspective anyways, I found this to be a really fascinating conversation. And one of the things that I find that's really a theme throughout this conversation, and even with your advice to the younger early childhood educators out there, is, is authenticity. And whether that is, you know, with your program and what type of methodologies and pedagogy you're following, or whether it's working with children directly or your colleagues, your teachers, it's having this authentic um, view of the world and making sure you start in your heart, as you say. So that's some great advice and and really a a great thing to live by as an early childhood educator. So Marilyn, thank you so much for coming on the show and telling us a little bit more about Waldorf. It was my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. If you enjoyed our conversation, don't forget to subscribe for more episodes and leave a review. The Preschool Podcast is brought to you by Hi Mama. 
If you're anything like the thousands of teachers listening to the preschool podcast, you know how long it takes to fill out daily sheets, child portfolios, and lesson plans. And that's where Hi Mama saves the day. With an easy to use interface built by teachers for teachers, Hi Mama can cut the time you spend on documentation and parent engagement in half. Create and send beautiful daily sheets, photos, videos, and messages to parents in seconds, saving you time in your busy day. Podcast listeners can get a free tour with one of our community advisors. Go to HiMama.com and